Hello and welcome to the Magical Midlife Podcast, where you get a refreshing, uplifting and optimistic perspective on life in your 40s and 50s. I'm your host, Lindsay DeSwart, and I'm delighted that you've joined us here today. So let's jump right in. So hello and welcome to today's Magical Midlife episode. And today I am joined by an international friend of mine called Emma Murphy. And Emma has a very interesting business. Well, a combination of businesses, actually. She's a disordered eating um, therapist and also now trains other health professionals in this industry and some other health industries, too, which we will get on to later. So thank you for being with us today, Emma. You're very welcome, Lindsay. Delighted to be here. Excellent. So, Emma, as always, I would love to find out more about the journey that has got you to your magical midlife now. Because to get to the age that we've got to now, most of us have seen a few ups and downs. Absolutely. Yeah, fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. And if we could have set it all out, as we thought we were going to when we kind of started out in our 20s, well, probably most of us wouldn't imagine that we're going to be where we are right now. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so can I, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about where you are in the world, you know, family, and then let's start at where you started your career and how your life path has taken you. Okay. Um, so I'm in Wicklow in Ireland um, and I have uh, one daughter. She's 15 and a half. Uh, married to Tony and I'm 53 and as you said Lindsay I'm currently working as a disordered eating specialist psychotherapist but I now primarily train other therapists and health and nutrition coaches to work in my specialist area emotional binge eating but we'll we'll talk about how that business is evolving later but when I left school in 1986 in the absolute depths of a, a recession in Ireland. We had a very, very big recession in the 80s in Ireland. There were very few opportunities for women, really. Like when I look back and I remember the career guidance teacher offering us, you know, we could be a Vanguard, which is a female policewoman, um, an air hostess, a secretary, a teacher, or a nurse. And that was wow. pretty much it. Oh. Yeah, we were not encouraged to look at going on to third level education, as in university. Um, Now, I did go to university. Um, I decided to do an arts degree. Um, And even then, I remember Miss Crowley, the, you know, guidance teacher just couldn't really understand what I was doing. And I I was doing French, Spanish and politics um, because I wanted to be (laughs) a political correspondent in the European Union. And that's what I wanted to be. So what inspired you to want to be want to do that? My best friend's dad. (laughs) Yeah, Sean Dignan, who would have been a well-known TV kind of personality here in Ireland. But when I say TV personality, he was a news. He he read the news. You know, he was a journalist. Yeah. And um, in fact, he didn't read that. He did read the news, but he was he was a political correspondent. And he later went on to be the press secretary for one of our Taoiseachs, who's, who's our prime minister. Um, so, you know, he had a very exciting sort of life um, and very politically driven. And I really admired John and I really liked what he did. And I loved English and I loved writing. Um, so journalism was something that I was interested in doing. And I liked languages and I was pretty good at French in school. And we learned Spanish in school as well because I happened to go to a school that was uh, run by Spanish nuns. So it was very unusual to do Spanish at all in Ireland back then. And yeah, I decided to go to um, college and study French, Spanish and politics with a view to going to the European Union. Yeah. And being a political correspondent. So that was ah. that was what I was going to do. And so did you actually ever spend time as a journalist? No. Oh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> Love that. I didn't. I, I dropped out of college after first year. I actually hated it. I hated um, college. There was 500 people in my French class. Oh. Um, yeah, at about 300 in my uh, political science class. Um, and I had great fun in college. And I we went to Russia, actually, on a trip. I always remember that. That was absolutely fantastic fun. And I've only just found photographs from that trip recently and really brought me back down memory lane. But um, 
yeah, I didn't really enjoy college back back then. Um, and I don't, I honestly don't think we set um, kids up for college. I don't think you really have any understanding of what college is going to be like when you're leaving school. Mm-hmm. I really don't think they prepare school leavers for what college is going to be like. Um, because it's such a, a different sort of environment and such a different way of working and you're far more autonomous in college and actually I couldn't really cope with that at the time because I'm not good or wasn't good at kind of motivating myself back then I kind of I was very carrot and stick like I really needed to be you know pushed to do stuff it wasn't that I, I mean naturally quite bright uh, but really only like studying the things I like to study so you know expect me to go and study political philosophy you know that just was never going to happen so um yeah I dropped out and my parents told me that if I ever went back to college I'd have to pay for it myself that it was right. a one and done so if I was dropping out now they keep paying as long as I stayed but if I dropped out it was on my own dime if I ever went back and I was like yeah yeah that's fine thinking I'll never go back and of course I was back two years later I actually went back or a year later I think I took a year out and then I went back but I did a bilingual secretarial course uh-huh using my French and still kind of had the journalism thing in the back of my mind and still had an idea that I could go to the European Union because I was the only place in Europe like that there were any jobs back then I like, honestly unless you wanted to go into the civil service so uh, I went and did my um, bilingual secretarial course that was very good and I enjoyed it and I knew and actually I was offered a job at the OECD through that and I didn't take it because I don't know why I didn't take it actually uh, I'm trying to remember there was something. Oh, yes, I wasn't going to be able to stay and finish my exams and graduate from my course if I took the job. I had to kind of go without getting my qualification. There was something telling me not to do it. Mm-hmm. And I've always been you know, good at my gut. I've always been good at following my gut instinct. Um, so graduated, temped for a while, was temping around the place. And then my friend who had gone ahead of me to... Gulf Air to work as an air hostess is writing me all these fabulous letters which again I just found in this big box of memories that my daughter found in my parents attic recently so I've really been going down memory lane the last kind of couple of weeks found all the letters there recently and she was saying oh it's brilliant and we're traveling here and traveling there going all to these exotic places that like nobody in Ireland got to go to Thailand and Sri Lanka I'd barely, I'd barely even heard of Sri Lanka Do you know like, where is Sri Lanka I didn't know um And I applied for Gulf Air and I went to London and I did the group interview and I got through. So at 22 years of age, I got on a plane and I flew to Bahrain in 1990 and started working for Gulf Air. Oh, my goodness. I never knew any of that. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I lived out in Gulf. I lived out in Bahrain for four years. I flew for two and a half years, went all around the world. Really eye opening, like coming from Holy Catholic repressed deep in recession Ireland and going to live honestly like lifestyles of the rich and famous yeah you know it was unbelievable tax-free 365 days of sunshine international you know community Uh, and again I was coming from quite Irish Ireland like Mm. you know I can't even begin to explain to you what Ireland was like back then it was unbelievable Getting my getting my clothes made by a tailor, uh, pulling out the pictures that I liked out of Vogue of the the Armani suit or the Gucci dress and bringing it down, going down to the souk and buying my material and then bringing it to the dressmaker and you know she'd you know make me whatever like it was all you know fake we were all doing it everybody was getting their fake this stuff and the other made going all around like going to all these really exotic Hong Kong and um, Thailand and you know all around the Middle East places that nobody none of my friends had ever heard of. Yeah. But in the meantime, Lindsay, I've, this is in 1990. So I flew out in um, July just after Ireland got knocked out of the quarterfinals of the World Cup by Italy. I'll never forget it. Three weeks later, the Gulf War started. Um, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Oh. So I was out there throughout the whole of the first Gulf War. <gasps> um, we flew in and out of uh, the the oil fires, the oil, the oil field fires. Um, we, we would fly to Kuwait at half one in the afternoon. We'd fly into the dark because of the the black smoke from the oil rigs and fly back out again um, into the light. It was unbelievable. We were flying soldiers around the place. We were having the crack with all the American GIs who were over serving. So they'd come over to Bahrain for their week's R&R mm-hmm. and we'd all be invited down onto the aircraft carriers for a party. 
mm-hmm. and they'd have a DJ on the, you know, where the helicopters landed. And of course, the first thing they did was get on to Gold Fair and say all the crew are invited to a party. You know, all they wanted was yeah. the girls to come up. And we had an absolute ball. But it really opened my eyes to a whole other life, an abundant life, a really rich life, a life where people had money and spent it and enjoyed themselves. And people had yachts and people went on holidays. And like this is a world away from how I was reared in Ireland. I mean, I've been on two foreign holidays, I think, before I got like literally two foreign holidays. Um, And I got to Paris a couple of times to visit my friend, which even that like going to Paris, like was, you know, quite exotic a lot of people just had to leave the country and, and go and work in the UK or in Australia mm. America a lot of people went to America at the time um so yeah I came back in 1994 was working in a in a wine company um so um, yeah set up a wine club um on based out of some experience I got out in Bahrain ironically mm. we're a Muslim country but I was actually working for a wine <laughs> working company out there and came back and set up a wine club with a uh, Mitchell's wine merchants here in Dublin and loved that um, and then uh, bought an apartment. Uh, and I, again, I can't describe to you, Lindsay. And I mean, you and I met through our financial education course. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, in Cape Town, which was yeah. fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. Like back then, I was like way ahead of my time, I, I mm-hmm. suppose. You know, buying an apartment as a single female in her 20s, you know, nobody else did that. Like everybody else is getting engaged and getting married and buying their three bedroom semi detached in an estate. Um, and I was buying an apartment on my own, um, which and I did, and I bought, I bought my first apartment. So um, I had to get a better job. So I went and I joined, I, I joined the Chamber of Commerce mm-hmm. and I was in small business development. And again, I'm going back to, I'm talking about 1996, 1997. And I, I was trained as a trainer to help small businesses put their business online and develop a website. Like, and again, when nobody... Yeah, nobody was on the interweb. Like nobody. No, seriously. Yeah, and the Chamber of Commerce. I went down to Limerick and I had to do this training and I got trained as a trainer and I was uh, helping small businesses to put their business onto the internet before anybody was even looking for things on the internet. Google had been invented. Like it was Mm. unbelievable. Out of that experience of working in small business development and um, getting interested in business and, you know, how businesses worked and entrepreneurship and all mm-hmm. of that kind of thing, I kind of thought I better go back to college and get a get a qualification and, you know, kind of learn a bit more about this. You know, so I was kind of thinking, will I go back and do a commerce degree? Will I go back and do economics? Just every time I looked at them, I kind of lost the will to live. Like, because just <laughs> although I really enjoyed doing it, the thought of going back and having to do all that learning you know financial stuff and whatever like I just you know the, the two things didn't connect for me yeah um and in the meantime I'd been volunteering with the rape crisis center so um just decided What's that? um the Dublin rape crisis center so oh sorry crisis center yeah. yeah sorry I was a volunteer with the rape crisis center and actually what I was doing was I was meeting victims of rape and sexual assault up in the sexual assault treatment unit in one of our national hospitals and uh, being their advocate as they went through that very horrendous process of the doctor having to you know collect any DNA samples that they could get and the and the guards the 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 police wanting to question them and we were there as a kind of a um an advocate for the victim yeah. and making sure that they weren't getting forced into doing something that they weren't ready to do or they weren't comfortable to do or that kind of, and a lot of the, the guards were male as well. So, you know, to have a female advocate for, for obviously for a female victim and that kind of thing. Mm. And out of that, on the day after my 30th birthday, I walked out of the Chambers of Commerce of Ireland office and down the road to the American College of Dublin. And I signed up for a four year psychology degree starting that September. So this is in April. And I just, I didn't know how I was going to pay for it. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't know how I was going to work and do a full-time degree at the same time. But I just knew that this is what I was had to do and I, it would all work out. And I started college in that September. I rented out my apartment. I moved back home with my parents. I sold my car. I bought a moped. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and um, drawing on my secretarial skills from my secretarial training, I became a PA to a female chief executive of what's now a really well-known company. I was, I was PA to Anne Herity, who owns CPL, which is, mm-hmm. um, she just sold it now for a humongous amount of money. 
and she would have been one of the first sort of inspirational women I would have come across, you know, again, way ahead of her time, leading a, a really successful business. And uh, yeah, I used to sit outside her door and do her typing uh, to get me through college. And I also took a second job as a legal secretary. So that was at night going into a lot of the law firms have a second team of secretarial staff who come in at night because the yeah. lawyers had to late late nine, 10 o'clock at night. And um, I worked as a legal secretary in a law firm and I also uh, did audio typing for barristers in mm -hmm. the law library um, and learned quite a lot about the law. And it was quite interesting. Uh, you know, I kind of enjoyed that work because I, I would um, has always stood to me, I have to say. Mm. Yeah, I did various different things, worked at three or four different jobs. Um, but my the interesting thing was there was a there was a bubble at the time in Ireland around property. So suddenly we all began getting a bit property mad and, you know, apart, they were starting to build a lot of apartments. We the, we came out of the recession. And so, you know, the beginning of the 90s or the, kind of the end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s. Mm -hmm. And um, my little apartment that I bought um, kind of shot up in value and the banks were throwing money at people. And I was able to remortgage, you know, draw down on the equity value that I built up in the apartment. Mm -hmm. And so I was studying my degree in psychology and at one point I had three apartments, all rented. I was living in one of them and I had a lodger with me, a, a guy who I was working with. And I had two other apartments rented out. What was I, 33 maybe? Yeah, 33. Oh 30. my goodness. Yeah, my apartment, I bought my apartment for £47,000, uh, pounds, Irish pounds. And by the time I sold it, mm -hmm. it was worth €250,000. Holy cow. Yeah. That was an investment that was worthwhile. Yeah, uh, that was in less than 10 years. My goodness. So I was able to leverage that to buy two yeah. other properties. And then I sold, I actually bought an apartment in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. um, I, had a, I had an apartment in Cape Town, rented out for a while. And um, I ultimately was able to sell kind of all the apartments. And I bought a I, like sorry, I bought a house first. And I was put myself under serious pressure at that point because I had the house and I had two apartments. But I had the house and then... I sold everything. And at one point I, I was living in the house and my mortgage was only 60,000 euro. Wow. That's nothing. My but I didn't goodness. know what I was doing, Lindsay. That's oh. the <laughs> important thing. Like I did and I didn't because yeah. I then leveraged myself all over again and, and borrowed against that property and um, bought, bought another property and, and at the height of the market. And then mm. we got absolutely stuffed. Ah, the highs and the lows, hey? So I went from being like on top of the world, uh, you know, bought and sold three apart, four apartments, three in Ireland, one in South Africa, ended up living in my own three bedroom house, which I did up from scratch because it was you know, it needed a huge amount of work doing to it when I bought it and ended up living in that house with a mortgage of 60,000 euro mm -hmm. and went full circle into like, you know, got absolutely caught out at the top of the market, bought out a holiday home, which is still in negative equity today, still technically still in negative equity today. Yeah, I ended up having to sell that house. I had to sell it, mm -hmm. made a tiny profit on it. And that paid off a chunk of the other house that I still, that's still a negative equity. Mm -hmm. um, had a horrendous time, banks writing to me, threatening to, you know, take me to court. Got, I, I did get a letter at one point saying, put the keys in, in an envelope and send them into us. There's a good girl. And that was, all of that was going on. And then I found our, um, I'm not, I don't know whether I'm supposed to mention who we. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ann Wilson. Yeah. yeah. Wilson, I found Ann Wilson online and I went off to do FFU and that uh, turned the roller coaster from down to up. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. OK, so in all of that. Yeah. How did you get into being eating disorder therapist? Yeah. So that was so I went down to the American College Dublin and signed up for the degree in psychology and was immediately drawn to eating disorders, was just doing essays on it, proud projects on it. You know, no idea why I never had an eating disorder myself. I never struggled with it myself. I found out, of course, as you go through becoming a therapist, you have to do a lot of personal work and a lot mm -hmm. of therapy for yourself. And um, a supervisor actually said it to me, you know, you actually get the clients that you need and um so the mirroring is is huge in therapy and i i am that person i am that personality type i just never had an eating disorder but i am the perfectionistic high achieving all or nothing black or white thinker i was a real cognitive person in my head all the time mm. and even though i had a very good gut and intuition i rarely tapped into my emotional side and um, so very up in the head very mental kind of person mm. 
Um, I was a people pleaser, even though I was very strong and I could do a lot for myself. I also was, I used to say I was strangely unassertive and I was aware of the fact that I was very unassertive in some situations. And of course, then I realized that that's kind of that people pleasing of like not wanting people to not like you and, you know, mm. not being good at having your own boundaries. So yeah, I ticked all the boxes for the personality type that, that goes with emotional and binge eating, but um, just never had the eating disorder myself. Specialized in the area, went off and did specialist training. And then over the 10 years, 12 years that I was in my own practice, you know, the profile of clients coming in with disordered eating changed from being people with anorexia and bulimia mm. to women um, kind of 35 to 55 or 60 um, who had struggled with the most eating and binge eating for like 10, 20, 30 years. Mm. Um, and it was a real legacy issue in Ireland because, of course, it all went back to how we were living in the, how these women like myself were brought up in the 60s and 70s. Um, a lot of alcoholism in the family, a lot of depression, um, a lot of death, a lot of a lot of children would have died. A lot of people died. Our health system wasn't great. We had TB. We had polio. We also had very large Catholic families and women giving birth once a year for the whole of their childbearing re- years. Like so a lot of people lost like two or three or four children. Um, and so a so lot of grief in there. A lot of grief, a lot of, lot of loss and a lot of abuse. Because, you know, as everybody knows, um, in Ireland, we had a we had a serious issue with clerical abuse and other you know, sexual abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. Uh, a very sad history of a lot of abuse in, in our past. And I found in the when I was in my practice then in the 2000s that women were coming in and um, were really only able to maybe start processing what happened now and and often uh, people waited for their parents to die or at least one of their parents to die before they felt they could come in so so there wasn't a betrayal around coming in to get counseling around what happened in the past but also like counseling didn't exist in Ireland you weren't supposed to talk about your feelings Mm. you you know what what goes on in this house stays in this house stuff it down deeper (laughs) never come back to get you (laughs) yeah um, as the lid came off mental health and mental health awareness became better in Ireland and it's getting better, and better all the time, still a long way to go, but it's getting better. People felt more um, less stigmatized and more able to reach out and ask for help. Yeah. And our average client is in her 40s and right. has been dealing with emotional eating or binge eating since, you know, the age of eight, the age of 10, the age of 12, decades old. Yeah. And it's all linked back to past trauma. Wow. Kind of a bit stumped now. So I, I um, could go down so many avenues asking you about that. OK, so what I'd love well, to do, go on. Tell you, don't, don't ask about that specifically, because what I'll, what I'll say is I'm a kind of a can do person and I want to I want to get people fixed and get them right. So I'm not I'm not one of these therapists that you come to for like five years. Mm. I developed a program. That's what I did. Mm. I developed a kind of a time limited structured program that worked broadly for the majority of clients you know so and it was based on the personality type and the commonalities of the the history like there was a history of trauma it had started very early on as a self-soothing mechanism they carried it into their adult life everybody had a different story and everybody's experience had been unique but there were enough commonalities that I was actually able to develop a framework or structure or way of working with this client which is based around how they how they worked so like that kind of mental cognitive sort of up in the head mm-hmm. we started with CBT and nutritional rehabilitation so you know just that we actually tackle the, the eating first mm-hmm. and then out of my own learning of like how to go deeper and tap into my own emotional world and and connect myself with my emotions and my inner child and all that stuff that had happened you know like the normal um, emotional development you know milestones that people meet or don't meet um, I was able to bring that into my work with clients and kind of say, OK, well, we start with the head stuff and the practical and the tool and let's do this and the nutritional rehabilitation and the plan. And then we do the neuroscience. And I was drawing very heavily on my experience in psychology around that and my work experience in the National Rehabilitation Hospital in the brain injury unit when I was studying um, and, and explaining to people what was going on in their brain and, and why they were stuck in this pattern and why the autopilot was so strong. And it was nothing to do with willpower and everything to do with how your brain was trying to keep you safe. Mm-hmm. And that linked back to the trauma. And then we were able to bring the client to the point where we were able to talk about the, the trauma and unpack the past from the present and separate the food from the feelings and give them that toolkit of resources that they needed to cope when they were feeling stressed or pressurized um, and to be able to move on from the past and let go of what no longer served them. So bringing, in, it, bringing them into that very deeply self-compassionate place. And that's that's where clients are not when they come in. They, they, mm-hmm. they don't. They're not good at self-care. They're not good at self-compassion. And I wasn't good at it either. 
Um, and I had to learn how to get good at it. And then I had to um, teach my clients how to get good at it. So, so what kicked you into learning to get good at it? Because ultimately, as you say, you can't bring that to your clients unless you've done it yourself. Yeah, so it was around the time that I, um, you know, I suppose there's a phrase around at the moment about waking up or getting woke. <laughs> oh, I hate that getting woke. So, um, oh, come on. I, my awakening, like my cosmic kick up the bum, you know, came. There you go. It was, it was around the time that I found Anne Wilson, actually. I then, I found a, a kind of a business coach to work with to kind of help me kind of finesse my program and sell my program and, you know, kind of get the business skills that I need. Because remember, I didn't go to college to do business, you know, yeah, ultimately yeah. back in the day. Um, and through her, I came across a self-compassion uh, program. And it was, again, one of those situations I came across this person I was looking at their stuff online and the next thing I found myself in Brighton on a workshop for a weekend and I like really I was there going what am I doing here like I have no idea it was just that internal guidance got you there just, yeah the intuition again it was just I know I need to go on this program and I got broken down and put back together again basically you know and and just it's like the turn of the kaleidoscope where, you know, you twist the tube and the whole picture changes. And just that really deep understanding of you really, if you don't look after yourself first, mm-hmm. you know, you can't really look after anybody else. And, you know, the, the, the message that come, came out of it was if er, imagine if everybody in the world, Lindsay, was actually able to meet their own needs. Mm-hmm. And you just think about that, like if we were all actually able to meet our own needs can you imagine how different the world would look Mm -hmm. yeah that's a massive thought I mean Brene Brown says that we are the most addicted medicated obese Mm, I know so (laughs) off balance unhealthy population ever despite all the technological advantages and the health advances and we've never been more deprived in terms of self-care and self-love yeah oh absolutely so how old would you have been when you were on that course in Brighton oh I'm 53 now 45 46 for somewhere around there 2015 okay. 2016 that's when the whole that's and when so everything what, changed. so yeah. when you came back after that because having done lots of personal development my, myself I know that when you come back from courses like that as you say the whole picture has changed oh. and you stroll back into the family house and everybody else is carrying on as normal and you come back in going everything changed so how did that play out when you got back um I don't think anything changed straight away okay um I think I look back now and I realize certainly myself and my husband have come a long way Mm -hmm. we communicate very differently now to how we did then but it was a slow burning sort of you know, incremental chip away and chip away. I just got better at communicating. I got better at asking for what I wanted and needed. Yeah. I got better at supporting him actually and, you know, making him let me support him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have to say lockdown has been very good for us as well. I mean, my husband has gone through his own challenges as well and work and stuff like that. And yeah, everybody does, things happen. And we had to have a good few chats about that because he was being the usual strong, silent Irish male, you know, and not talking about things. And, you know, that that was hard. But I had to I had to kind of break him down a bit, you know, and Mm -hmm. help him to understand that, you know, we're in this together and we're a team. And actually, by locking me out, he was probably doing more damage Mm -hmm. than he realized. And and we had to have some very honest conversations about that, you know, Um. And I know that we both were carrying and this is very common. I mean, you know, and as a therapist, I know this and I you know, spoke to clients about it quite a bit. But when you see it happening in your own relationship, it's actually quite funny. Um, <laughs> you realize that you both come from your own set of parents with family and your own family. You have their own values, their own rules and all of that stuff. And, you know, his family were very different to mine. But like my family rules were just as bizarre <laughs> than his, mm-hmm. you know, as his in some ways. Um and really giving yourself permission to let go of everybody else's rules and thoughts and opinions and just do things your own way. And, and we're still very much on that journey of like, you know, to use the Irish vernacular, like feck everybody else. It's none of their bloody business. You know, we'll just 
Like it's our life. He's 57. I'm 53. And we'd like to be bopping around Europe in a camper van in the next five years. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of our friends and family will think we're absolute lunatics if we go and do that. And I mean, like, actually think we've lost the plot. <laughs> You know, uh, but we don't care because yeah. we've, we've found a place where we're able to actually be far more honest and authentic with each other. Um, and just, yeah, really just not be bothered by what other people think. And that's huge in Ireland because everybody in Ireland, you know, puts a lot of store by what other people think. Yeah, it's very externally referenced. Yeah. Absolutely. And then so since you've had your awakening, awakening, she says, with fingers in the air for audio. How has that changed how you raise your daughter? I That has been the game changer and really? rearing her, yeah, completely differently. Now, my mum was great in, in a lot of respects. She was really good at talking to me mm-hmm. and being relatively open, but she could only be so open given where she came from yeah, um, and how she'd been raised. But she was good and we had a good relationship and, you know, we used to go off and do things together, mother, daughter time and that kind of thing. I was the eldest and then I had a brother and sister who were twins. So that was quite interesting too because they kind of got to... They relied on each other. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of was, I was like an only child at times. You know, they were two and a half years younger than me, which is a lifetime when you're young. So my mom was good, but she, um, I suppose there was other things that we weren't able to talk about really. And But she was very good around telling me that boys could be friends. You could be friends of boys and that mm-hmm. they didn't all have to be a potential boyfriend. Um, she was quite good at letting my friends be around the house and been in the house. So, you know, she wanted to know who I was hanging around with. And, I, and for some reason, I always felt there was an open door. Like I always brought people home and introduced them to my parents. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, and I try and do the same with Robin now. I try and make sure, you know, we are the house that the, the kids can always come to our house. There's always pizza in the freezer and she can always have her friends on sleepovers. And and I talk to her, honestly, you know, I, I do. She's 15 and a half now and I talk to her about drinking and boys and you know sex and I I really try and have those open conversations and I mean like I could die a death sometimes when I'm having them with her but yeah yeah really and what about the conversation of money because you and I okay. as I say we met through learning about money and it sounds as if you've really had a very enlightened experience with money both with the highs and the lows yeah, and I mean, I like I I now I'm now doing it the right way. Like, but, you know, <laughs> I, I, I was very lucky. I think that I got to, I would say, not accidentally, but I did kind of accidentally get to surf a wave. Mm-hmm. You know, Ireland Celtic Tiger money sloshing around. You know, but then we got very badly burnt, and we got you know we really did. So now I feel I do it the right way, where I actually know what I'm doing, and I when I, I do things deliberately, and I'm doing them for a reason. Yeah. Um. So and I have a plan. You know. I'm not great at sticking to plans. I don't really like being told what to do, but, you know, I, 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 I bigger picture, I can do it and I do do it. But I also talked to Robin about it and she's quite entrepreneurial. She she won an award in school for um, she came second in some kind of, you know, regional competition and young entrepreneur scheme. What was it called? Bath in a box or something something like that but it was kind of yeah. they got epsom salts and they soaked them in oils and they made they put them in nice little pots and made stickers and you know and sold them and uh yeah it was lovely um and they won a prize you know so she's quite entrepreneurial she's driven by she wants to have her own money and she wants to manage her own money and i allow her to do that and you know mm-hmm. we don't pay for everything we make her pay for stuff and she has a Revolut card now and my husband has started he just opened a little he opened a Revolut trading account and he's kind of showing her just how to buy and sell shares and how it works. And, you know, now she's not that interested, mm-hmm. but she also knows that I have a Giro account and I've shown her that. And, you know, we've kind of don't think it's really capturing her imagination right now, mm. but she divides all her money in three. She saves into the bank and that mm-hmm. can never be touched. Like that's locked away that that account, it goes in and it does not come out. Mm-hmm. And we decide what will happen with whatever's in there when she's 18 or 21 or whenever she asks. Um, a third of it then is her save to spend. So she saves towards her orders on, you know, boohoo.com or whatever she's buying, you know, her clothes and her bits and bobs. And um, then she has her money in her pocket then for her ice cream and her, you know, whatever, when they're out and about um she gets pocket money and again you know she's just very good so like I I don't want to force it down her throat and I don't want to make a big deal out of it but Mm -hmm. I'm drip feeding her (laughs) the underlying principles without making too big a deal out of it yeah 
that's kind of yeah and, and I've said to her as well about school and college you know if she if she wants to do something like a business degree or commerce degree or something like that fine but if she doesn't that's fine mm-hmm. I trust I said I don't mind what you do as long as it's not something that's completely airy fairy please try and do something that's practical and that'll let you have a job while you travel around the world and get yeah. some experience and see other places and do other things just try and do something that you know will help you in that regard mm-hmm. um so yeah I'm trying to you know guide her without being too heavy-handed fantastic so I'm conscious of time um thank you for sharing that story that's I I'm completely I actually feel honored that we've taken this time and that you've been so open because some of that stuff is the stuff you've experienced. Some people will never do that. Not even now will never do that in their life. And the fact that you had such courage when you were younger to just take a step and then go international and then do studying and then follow your intuition, which is a really brave step. And I will say the biggest thing was, as I said, I, I surfed a wave the last time. Um, you know, there was, was a, there was a whole environmental sort of input into what we did and, you know, buying the properties and selling the properties and then getting completely burnt and like losing. And, and we lost a six figure sum, like, you know, I'm not going to lie about it. We mm-hmm. were looking. And I know people who lost like seven and eight figure sums, you know, mm-hmm. so um, it was a big it was a really big deal. Um, the thing about doing the the course that we did and getting involved in Anne Wilson's um, program, Lindsay, is really important um, because now I'm running my business with a purpose and I know exactly what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. So moving up into training other therapists, um, you know, licensing the program that I developed um, now looking to bring it international you know we're now training people in so fresh COVID was great because we went online we were able to I was going to ask about that yeah we were able to turn it around and, and bring it online so um, that's been really amazing um, and other th- other exciting things in the works now you know um, but I'm doing it with a very clear idea of why and and making sure I'm contributing to my pension and you know doing all the doing all the right things this time around I did it all wrong the last time and I made a shed load of money Mm -hmm. but I lost an awful lot of it um because I wasn't doing it the right way Mm, fair enough Mm -hmm. so how can people find you and and just talk about because you are training more than just eating disorder therapists now aren't you yeah so what came out of eating freely so eating freely is the name of the program so if anybody is actually struggling with emotional eating and binge eating and if my story if what I explained earlier resonates with somebody and that it came from if there was a trauma in the background and that you know our program is is designed especially for um for you if that if that's your story um so eatingfreely.com is the website to um connect in with our network of therapists we've therapists in Ireland the UK and the states um and you can work with them either in person or online. Um, and we're just finishing updating our online self-directed program. So that'll be available in the next fortnight. So like by the end of July, definitely that will be up and running and you'll be able to just walk yourself through the program, depending on so depending on what you need, whether you need to work with somebody or whether you can do it on your own. But we're also training. Um, we train therapists and nutritional therapists and health and nutrition coaches because they are the people that our clients will go and seek help from. So we want to make sure that they have the skills that they need, because a lot of our clients would walk into maybe a health and nutrition coach and say, I want to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if that health and nutrition coach doesn't ask the question, do you binge eat or eat for emotional reasons? And a lot of them don't ask that question in their intake. The client won't tell them. And then they're put on a diet and that's not the help that they need. They need the specialist help to overcome the binge eating disorder. Um, And what's really interesting for me, the statistic when we did our research is that up to 30 percent of adults who describe themselves maybe as yo-yo dieters or cereal dieters actually meet the criteria for binge eating disorder. But the weight loss programs will not be able to help them. So our mission now is to train the health professionals that our clients go to so that they're going to be able to work with them effectively and do the right work um, to really help that client move on. So if you're looking for training in this area and wanting to specialize in this area, our training platform is opalsuccess.com. So that's opal as in the opal stone, O-P-A-L. And 
uh, we can license you as an eating freely practitioner wherever you are. Um, comprehensive 12 week training program all online and really tons of support, tons of learning, very practical, very implementable. So again, mm-hmm. my big thing is if you're going for training, you better get a return on your investment. So <laughs> we've tried to bake, we have actually baked that in completely. But now we're looking at um, scaling up and, you know, working with other subject matter experts to develop their specialist client programs into um, CPD approved or CE approved professional trainings. So we're now working with a menopause specialist, my self-compassion coach who I went to, Mm -hmm. um, um, somebody else who's helping us develop an advanced coaching skills program and somebody who's developing a program for digital marketing and selling online selling and marketing for yeah. health pre- coaches in practice because unfortunately they don't tend to have the business skills as I didn't mm-hmm. um, so I wanted to bring that in as well and as much as I had to learn how to run a business and be business minded and be business like in my business um, every health coach every therapist needs that help and support in terms of having those fundamentals in place that you're able to actually run your practice and work with your clients and bring about that change but also run your business Mm -hmm. and, you know, turn it into the the thriving practice that it needs to be to feed you as well as your clients, because, you know, you should be getting a really good salary out of it and being able to live and go on your holidays and and have a pension and all that good stuff. So, yeah, everything that I've been through, I want to, to teach that to other people, you know, and that's 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 my mission is just to make sure that it's a it's it's fully reciprocal you know I'm paying it forward and and I want our health coaches and therapists to pay it forward to their clients and mm-hmm. you know it's just it's everybody benefits it's, it's win 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 fantastic that's awesome very very cool okay so um thank you for the time today really appreciate it. it's lovely to reconnect with you really appreciate absolutely. it you couldn't believe it when we met I know absolutely we had a we webinar actually- we were like oh my god I know on a retreat webinar so let's we could be doing international retreats together too which would be fun so watch this space the eating freely residential retreat is coming in 2022 um so yeah that's my next uh my next project is to develop the residential retreat watch this space as I say maybe we'll do Canada Lindsay fine by me that's all right I'm I am up for that in a big way or Bali or Bali. I'm up for that too. Yes, that would be very cool. Okay. So if, um, if you've enjoyed this episode and you want to find out more about Emma, please go to eatingfreely.com and opalsuccess.com. Opalsuccess.com. But eating freely will actually bring you through to Opal Success anyway. If you click on a health professional, it'll bring you through to Opal Success. So eatingfreely.com. Um, and I'm always happy to talk. So if there, there is an inquiry form there. And if you fill that out at the moment, it comes to me directly. So any questions, just feel free to ping it into the contact form and I'll be responding personally. So happy to help. Fantastic. And if you know people who you think would benefit from listening to this particular episode of the podcast, please share it with your friends. I think it's a really, really important issue um, and very enlightening episode, I have to say. So thank you. Cool. And thank you for having me, Lindsay. I really appreciate it. You're so welcome. So again, this is Lindsay DeSwart from uh, Magical Midlife. And um, please subscribe, share this podcast, share it on social media. Please share it with your friends. And let's share this positive message of being in our magical midlife.